than that, I just want to welcome up Pastor Ben. We'll be preaching out of Acts 22. So if you can welcome Pastor Ben up. How's everybody? It's good to have you here tonight. Let's uh, open with a word of prayer. And then we'll get back into tonight's narrative. So, Father, again, we're just really grateful to be your children. Thank you, Lord, that we were once in darkness, but Lord, you shed your light and made yourself known to us, Lord. Thank you. And so, Lord, we want to just commit our time to you. We ask that you would, by your spirit, instruct and speak to your people, that you'd minister by your Holy Spirit, that you'd be glorified tonight, Lord, through the narrative of your servant, Paul. And Lord, we want to just lift up and pray for Israel in the name of Jesus and really for both sides, Lord, that are suffering, the, the innocent ones in all of it. Lord, we just commit them to you, Lord, the children. We pray, Lord, that you would protect from the trauma and the violence that's happening. Lord, we pray for a quick resolve, Lord, for peaceful times again for Israel. So we want to commit that to you, Lord. And all those suffering in India, too, Lord, we'd just like to remember them in prayer. Ask that you would bring help and comfort and the gospel, Lord, that you'd mobilize your people that are there. That you would anoint them, Lord, with the gospel and with your heart to minister. So, Lord, we're very grateful um, to be here tonight, Lord. Freedom in good health. We bless you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Acts chapter 22. Now, I don't know how many of you guys were here last week, but it was sort of a cliffhanger passage because we were cut short right in the middle of when things were about to just break forth. And if you remember, or for those that weren't with us, we'll just kind of recap a little bit about what's going on. We have Paul the Apostle, and he has been on these missionary journeys, many of them, and now he's finally returning once again to headquarters, if you will. Um, and we saw last week in the chapter that we looked at that he made his way back. He finally made it back to a place called Tyre, which if you look at your Bibles is sort of modern day Lebanon region. And he stayed with certain disciples there uh, for about seven days. And I love that picture, you know, isn't that beautiful for those that have traveled no matter where you are, if you go to a local fellowship or a church and you meet believers, you just feel like you're instant family with most of them. And so Paul had this relationship. He stays with them. And something very interesting happened. He was warned by the believers there. They felt impressed to let him know that, hey, man, there's nothing but troubles awaiting you in Jerusalem. And he said, why do you break my heart weeping? Don't you know that I'm ready to not only testify of the Lord Jesus in Jerusalem, but I'm even willing to die. And so he takes off and he goes down to Caesarea on the coast of Israel. And there he is encountered once again with a prophet, the prophet named Agabus. And Agabus has the same message. In fact, it was sort of one of these... Uh, uh, illustrated prophetic words, right? Took off the belt, put it up, fastened it on Paul, said, whoever owns this belt, chains await him. And so again, it was that prophecy. And it's very interesting kind of thought process to say, well, was Paul supposed to be going or was God just letting him know what's going to be going down? You know, very interesting topic. But nonetheless, he finally reaches himself to Jerusalem. And you have to remember that this is Paul the Apostle. And he has a testimony, just like most everybody in this room. We all have our own personal testimonies. And they're very powerful. And this is what we're going to look at tonight, is him sharing his personal testimony. But not to just anybody. He's sharing it with a group of people that are his own. They're fellow Jews. And he felt very compelled and motivated to share 
with his Jewish believers. And so much so that as we look at the scriptures together, we'll see that as we continue on here in the 22nd chapter, there's always a portion of, the, of your life that was prior to your conversion. And Paul's going to go through that. We'll look at that uh, verses 1 through 5. And then it's going to go into a presentation of his conversion or his encounter with Jesus. And then finally, it's going to end tonight with him sharing his mission that he received from the Lord Jesus. And so it's interesting to kind of look at Paul. Uh, in order to really appreciate Paul and his desire to share with these people, we know that in Romans, he would say in Romans chapter 9, that if he would, if he could, he had such a heart for his fellow countrymen that he himself would desire to be cut off from salvation if it could mean the salvation of his brethren, the Jews. That's a pretty powerful heart. I don't know that I could actually, in full confidence, tell you that there's anybody that I would give up my salvation for. And I would be hard-pressed to find anybody here that would say, you mean you would forfeit heaven for somebody else's salvation? But nonetheless, this was his heart and his mind. So let's pick it back up. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard him speak, in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent than he said. I was indeed a Jew born in Tarshish of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you are all today. I persecuted this way the, uh, to death, binding and delivering them into prison, both men and women. And also the high priest bears me witness and all the council and the elders from whom I also received letters from the brethren and went as far as Damascus to bring in chains every one of those uh, here to Jerusalem to be punished. So quite a zealous individual. Uh, zealous for his God and his understanding at the time of his God. We also look, and we know from other portions of the New Testament, sort of his credentials, if you will, and what he had to say. Let's first turn to Galatians chapter 1, uh, verse 3, if you desire to turn there. At Galatians verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 3, we read Paul saying, uh, sorry, verse 13. We read Paul say, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism and how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced, I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. So there's Paul saying exactly who he is or who he was, if you will, prior to his conversion. Again, in Philippians 3. So just a few things over here, chapters, books, Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 4. He says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has confidence in the flesh, I the more so. He says, you know who I am? I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, well, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, hey, persecuting the church. Concerning righteousness, which is in the law, I was blameless. That's Paul the Apostle, pre-conversion. That's the man that we're dealing with. And then, miracle of all miracles, he's converted. And he wants to share this conversion with those that are there among him. And so back at verse chapter 22 of the book of Acts. Picking it back up at verse 6. 
So now it happened. So now he's going to lay out his testimony. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon that suddenly a great light from heaven shone about me. And I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Notice that. Why are you persecuting me? Well, he wasn't. He was persecuting Christians. Well, in persecuting Christians, you're persecuting Jesus. Just know that. When you hassle a Christian, you're hassling Jesus. And so he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he answered, well, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with, with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. Another interesting account. I know we've been through this in the ninth chapter of Paul's conversion. But isn't that interesting? At his conversion, there was a strong light. They saw the light, but they didn't hear the voice. In conversion, you can be around other people and maybe even here tonight and you see the light, but you're not hearing the Lord calling you. Because everybody has an appointed time. Yes, you must believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. But there is a timing, isn't there? And I think as we reflect on our own selves, we can understand that as well. You know, maybe a, a sibling or a family member got born again before you. They saw the light. You hear tonight, see a light, but you don't quite hear the voice. Because none of the other guys we know that even got born again with him. But this was a radical conversion for this radical man. And I think that that's very interesting. Someone who is so driven like this man, we got a little snapshot of this character that we're dealing with, needed a radical wake-up call. Would you agree? A radical person is going to have to be radically woken up. And this is exactly what happened to Paul the Apostle on the road to Damascus, as we know it. So much so that there was this light from heaven, a voice spoke to him. And so I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, verse 10, arise and go into Damascus. And there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. He came to me, and he stood, and he said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know him and his will and see the just one. And hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And that's truly what happened to Paul the Apostle. In fact, at his conversion, Paul was told, This is a chosen vessel unto me. That he shall be my witness among the Gentiles. Among kings. And among the children of Israel. He got that word right when he got born again. But also, God added to that call, let him know how much things he will suffer for my name's sake. And we've seen Paul's sufferings. Stoned, shipwrecked later. Uh, we've seen a rod, beaten by rods, left for dead. All for the gospel's sake. All because it was the will of God for this man, Paul the Apostle. And so he's reiterating all of these things to his Jewish audience, whom he's got a tremendous heart and a desire to reach. And he's now given this opportunity to lay it all out before them. Verse 16, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and washed away all your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So again, he's reiterating the, the latter portion of his conversion experience. Now, it happened. 
as I returned to Jerusalem, that I was praying in the temple and that I was in a trance. And I saw him, God, saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I have imprisoned and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far uh, from here to the Gentiles. So he's reiterating the fact that he got converted. Then he went to Jerusalem after his conversion. While he was in Jerusalem, he fell into a trance. And in this trance, the Lord himself spoke to him and said, your testimony is not going to be received here. Now, we know from the, thir- uh, from the other chapter when we saw him in Jerusalem, we know that the disciples in Jerusalem actually told him as well. So they kind of confirmed. We're not told the exact order, whether the trance came first and then the confirmation to the disciples or vice versa. But the point is, is that the disciples themselves said, hey, we've heard news on the street. Uh, they're after you. And they took him down to Caesarea, put him on the next boat, and sent him to Tarshish, his home city. And he stayed there for many years until Barnabas, you remember in our book of Acts, Barnabas said, hey, there's a hallelujah happening in Antioch, and I got to go get Paul. Paul would just be perfect for this new work. And that's what really um, compelled him or pushed him into his whole missionary journey. So, again, he's just reiterating these things. But notice this. He had a heart. For the Jewish people, a Jew himself, a very zealous Jew to be exact. But yet, his primary calling from the Lord was going to be to the Gentiles. As it said, just as I have received apostleship, Paul would say, to the Gentiles, Peter has to the circumcision, or the as I have received apostleship to the uncircumcised, meaning the Gentile world, so Peter has to the circumcised or to the Jewish community. And I bring this up because he would indeed be witnessing to Jews, but not at the level that he might desire. And why I bring this up is I think this is something very practical for us to think about or to contemplate, even in your own life, where you might have a strong desire for something, but you're really not going to see the blessing of God on that because it's not your lane. It's not what God has called you to because each and every one of you in this room have a calling from the Lord. You have a special anointing and a gifting to reach certain people that I could never reach. And you have to find out, well, where is God blessing? And many of you have already discovered where you see God's hand of blessing. No matter that you had a heart for a certain particular group of people or a certain age group or whatever, and try as you may, you saw a little bit of fruit, but it wasn't anything like you saw in other places. And this is Paul the Apostle, I think, in so many ways. And it's very interesting that this trained Jew under the school tutelage of this grand master teacher called Gamaliel. Talk about the best university, if you will, or the best yeshiva school that you could have ever have attended was under the, this Gamaliel, Rabbi Gamaliel. You know, the Jews make a big boast about their rabbis. And this was a, a rabbi of the highest order that everybody knew. And so though he was trained and schooled though he was raised this way, zealous for the traditions of his father, God chose not to use him primarily among the Jews. He chose primarily to use a Galilean fisherman, Peter, who knew a lot about fishing, but not so much about the law necessarily, or he wasn't schooled in the traditions. 
and, and I think that's very interesting as well because when you discover what God has called you to do, sometimes it doesn't always match with your natural giftings. Have you ever noticed that to be true? Where you say, well, this guy would just be perfect. He would be able to minister to those people because he came from them. And sometimes it does happen. But other times, it's somebody that doesn't even relate to that lifestyle. And they go into those situations and God uses them in a tremendous way. I can think of many people that are like that. Do you guys all know people like that? Or other people in the church communities, you know, that have been used of the Lord, but they weren't necessarily those types of people. Because God gets the glory. Because you think there's no way. This is obviously the work of God. There's no boasting involved. I think of primarily, I don't know for those in here that would know, David Wilkerson. Does anybody know this David Wilkerson? Okay. Well, apparently he was just a good church boy as far as I know. And uh, I don't know, I can't remember the details, forgive me, but the idea is that he went into the roughest neighborhoods of New York City and he reached out to the, the big dudes in the gangs. And one of the guys, I think it was a, a Puerto Rican gang. Yeah? Nikki Cruz, thank you very much. But it was Puerto Rican, wasn't it? Puerto Rican gang? Yeah. And these guys were mean, ugly, angry, violent people. And they were pretty much ruling the streets of New York. And God doesn't send in, you know, some Puerto Rican, you know, that can relate to the deep fried bananas and all this kind of stuff that the Puerto Ricans like, you know. I mean, he sends in this white boy who just loves Jesus, who's called, and God transforms this Nikki Cruz. And he, it's called The Cross and the Switchblade. Uh, there's a movie based on this story. But my point is telling you this, is that here's a man who's totally maybe not qualified or somebody that you thought, oh, they'll never make a difference in that thing. And look what God did. Tremendous work. And so never underestimate the power of the Almighty in what he wants to accomplish in and through your life. Ask him because he created you. And sometimes he's so good, you know, you have a desire, it's a God-given desire. But other times, perhaps, there's just not a blessing on that. And that's okay, because you're going to see God's hand and blessing in some area of life. And it's very important, especially in these days. Each and every one of you, if you're a born-again child of the living God in this room, you have spiritual gift. And I hope you know what it is, and I hope you're using it. Because at the end of the day, that's all that's going to count. And so Paul, being primarily called to the Gentile world... He came back to Jerusalem, gave a grand report about all that God had done among the Gentiles. We just got done reading it. I mean, people getting saved all over the place, turning from their pagan idols. I mean, radical stuff. God's power with him against the demonic. We saw the demonic almost everywhere he turned. There was some sort of resistance. And it's because he was in his lane. I like that term. We use that a lot these days, don't we? Just get in your lane and stay in your lane. Find out where, where your groove is. Where has God called you? And then just go for it. It doesn't matter. Don't compare yourself to others. The Bible says that if you compare yourself to others, you do err. Oh, but I want to be this. Or I wish I could do that. And yeah, I want to be a worship leader. I, I do. I would have thought that would have been the awesome gift. You know, have a voice that just effortless comes out of your mouth instruments just come to you naturally i would have loved that uh-uh you'll never attend my worship service because i don't do them but the point is clear find out what you've got from the lord you'll see god's hand of blessing and we need you i need your gift you need my gift and so here's paul heart for the jew but yet they're going to turn on him. So, verse 22. And they listened to him until this word. 
What word was that? The G word. Gentiles. Oh. And they went into an uproar. What, did they, what happened to these guys? They heard the G word and that was it. And they listened to him until this word. And then they raised their voices and they said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out, they tore off their clothes and they drew dust into the air. Now, this is a Middle Eastern expression of great grief. You know, you rip your clothes out, you slap your face, you get all you get. I mean, this is what really is, you know. And if you look on the news today, you see them doing the same thing. They get excited and this is what they do. You know, I haven't seen that, but you know, this idea of this, and this big demonstration of emotion and oh my gosh, you would have thought this, this is, it makes our riots look like Disneyland, you know, compared to these crazy guys. And then there's thousands of rocks everywhere in Jerusalem. I mean, all over Israel for that matter. I mean, you know, <laughs> so you find your next rock and you're getting ready to, it still happens today. But nonetheless, as soon as you use the word Gentiles. Now, it wasn't a foreign concept for a Jew to think God would save a Gentile. It wasn't. In fact, in, in I believe it's Matthew 25, he told, Jesus gave a few woes. And he said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. For you travel land and sea to make one proselyte. And once you win them, you've made them twice, twice the son of hell as you are. Good old Jesus. But the idea was they would seek out non-Jews, proselytes. So as they were known as. And so this concept of God saving the Gentile world isn't a foreign concept. In fact, even at the very beginning of scriptures, if you knew your scriptures at all, you would know that in believing Abraham, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed through believing Abraham, the father of faith. So it was always God's design to save the entire world. And Jesus is the savior of the world. We know that salvation is of the Jew first and then the Gentile, because all of the holy ordinances, the law of Moses, everything, the building of a nation was started with Abraham and continued on through his uh, sons. You got Abraham, and then you had Isaac, and then you had Jacob and Jacob's 12 kids, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Judah, all those 12 guys. They became the 12 tribes. He started a nation. And then, of course, later on, Moses comes. He gives them the law. These are the holy ordinances of God. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, it talks about us Gentiles who at one time we were without hope in the world. We were strangers to the commonwealth of Israel because all of these wonderful illumination of truth and of righteous ways was only delivered to this Jewish people. And God intended the Jewish people to be a light to the Gentiles. Remember that? That was his whole desire. So, it's not that the Gentiles were looked at as, you know, anathema, you know, something that's lower than the lowest, though there was this prejudice. You know, after all, I am a Jew. And there was a great pride in the fact that you were a Jew and not a, a Gentile. We know that. And, you know, prejudice. Anytime you think you're better than somebody else, it's really, truly a prejudice. Well, God knows nothing about prejudices. He loves all men equally. And um, so Paul says this G word, and they just go berserk. They go bonkers. Because in a sense, what he's really telling them is, hey, the law of Moses really makes of no effect for salvation. In fact, you need to be, Mr. Jew, you need to be saved by faith, just as the Gentiles need to be by faith. And, and this was a point of contention throughout the entire translation, or transition, I should say, from Judaism to Christianity. 
Because remember this, God did not get rid of the Old Testament. He fulfilled it. There's a big difference. Jesus himself said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Do you get that? That's a huge difference because especially when you're talking with a Jew, you never want to say stuff that would indicate that God just got rid of that old system. He didn't get rid of the old system, right? Are you following me? Uh, for instance, you still need a sacrifice. Did you know that? God didn't say you don't need a sacrifice anymore. He says, yeah, you need a sacrifice. But guess what? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus became the final, ultimate sacrifice. Oh, but what about a high priest? Well, yeah, you need a high priest. You're a sinful person. You can never approach a holy God. You still need a high priest. You need a mediator. Well, Jesus comes on the scene. The whole book of Hebrews, if you know it, it all says Jesus is your high priest now. But he's after a superior order, not that of the Aaronic priesthood or the Levi, Levitical priesthood, but he's of a superior order, that of Melchizedek. And he goes on to great lengths to explain what that means. It's an eternal priesthood. So Jesus is our high priest. See, God didn't get rid of it. He just fulfilled it. And you can go on and on about the dietary laws and different things. God didn't say, hey, we're just throwing that away. It was a really bad idea in the first place. That's not what God did. But he fulfilled it. And so this to a Jew is tremendous news. Because Paul knew about this law. Paul knew the heaviness of the law. He knew about the, the, the inability really to perform. You know, he said, hey, I was doing great. I was of the law blameless. Yeah, at a certain understanding, you were blameless. Hey, I've never, you know, never did this, never did that. But then Jesus comes along and he says, hey, if you did it in your heart, you've already done it. Paul says, hey, I didn't even understand covetousness until I understood. And it slew me. The law slew me. I understood the real point of covetousness. And, and I was guilty. And so it's not the idea of, you know, hey, I, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with girls that do. Therefore, I'm a really good person and I'm going to go to heaven. That's not it. If you've offended in one point of the law, you're guilty of it all. And guess what? We all qualify. We're all offenders. Some worse than others. I get that. But one you're guilty of all. So that's a tremendous news to a Jew who lived under the law. See, none of us, I don't know if any Jews are here, forgive me, but I, I would imagine most of us are Gentiles. So we don't really appreciate, you know, what we've really been delivered from in a sense. You know, we, we appreciate it in our own personal lives, but we were never practicing Jews. We never had to bring the sacrifices. We never had to do this and do that. And you know what I mean? We just are thankful for Jesus, and, and that's a wonderful reality and a truth. But to a Jew, this was tremendous. And he had a heart. He says, I want my Jewish people to know the freedom. That our great God was faithful. He came through. He gave us the salvation. He promised it from time and eternity. He promised it to us, and he fulfilled it. And it was in the most miraculous way. He sent his own son into the world. It was God in a bod. God in flesh. And we, he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten son of God, full of grace and truth. And, and this is the Jesus of Nazareth that he's portraying to his people. And guess who this Jesus of Nazareth was? It was none other than our Messiah, our Mashiach, our Messiah. And it was God in flesh. Wow. And he wants these people to know it's been fulfilled some 20 years after this little preaching thing going on here, they're not going to even have a temple to worship at because God's going to abolish this thing once and for all. In fact, he's going to destroy the very uh, ability that you would have to even practice this way because it's been not abolished, but fulfilled. And so these are the tremendous truths. This is what's weighing heavy on his heart. You know, to have understood the ins and the outs of the Jewish mindset. Now is his time. You know, he probably felt like there was some unfinished business. He tried it before in Jerusalem, and then he had to get on the next boat and take off. And now he's finally back. And now is his chance. He's been arrested. He's stopped the whole process of being arrested. That's what we're dealing with here. And they allow him to speak, and he's speaking 
to them in their language. They're attentive. They think this is interesting. This man, he's got something to say. They're listening to him until he gets to the word Gentile. And then they just blow up, just like they did with Jesus. No, no servant is greater than his master. If they hated me, they'll hate you. And so here's Paul, and he gets this sort of reaction. Verse 24, then the commander ordered him to be brought back into the barracks. And he said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? <laughs> oh. Now, Paul uses this citizenship card to his advantage. And he knows, I mean wrongfully condemned, number one, but number two, I'm a Roman citizen. And that had tremendous value and privileges that came with it. I think for anybody that could understand, you know, coming from a foreign country, perhaps that's less privileged than the United States, they come here, they get all the advantages and privileges of citizenship once they become a citizen. Well, in the Roman world, under Claudius, um, there was an exemption that people could actually buy a citizenship. First time ever. But beyond that, if you were a citizen, you had privileges. And the privileges were, first of all, you could never be condemned unjustfully. You had to go through a trial. You had to be heard out. It's like what we have in our, you know, uh, court systems. Uh, it used to be said, right? And I pray that we could get back to that mentality. You know, you're really innocent until proven guilty. It's just unfortunate to be in a situation or a society that judges you right away without hearing it all out. And so that was, un, that was verboten, as it says in German. You don't do that to a Roman citizen. You've got to have charges. He's got to go through his proper channels. And so they're about to give him the lashing. And he says, oh, is this how you treat a Roman citizen? And they thought, oh, hold it, stop. Because they could be the, the, the people that are trying to condemn him or, or whip him un, un, unnecessarily. Uh, to a Roman citizen who hasn't gone through the justice of a trial or any of these things, they could be held accountable and they could be punished as well. So hands off. Let's hold on a minute here. Um, and when the centurion heard it, verse 26, that he went and he told his commanding officer saying, well, take care what you do for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, tell me, are, are you a Roman? And he said, yes. And the commander answered, with a large sum, I've obtained my citizenship. And Paul said, well, actually, I was a born citizen. Because, of course, he was born in Tarsus, though a Jew. And, and being born, he automatically had citizenship. Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman, and because he had bound him. Then the next day, because he wanted, or sorry, for the next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bounds and commanded the chief priest and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. And so we're going to leave it there because it's going to get even more interesting. So you'll have to come back next week because now he's been released from the Roman uh, punishment, if you will, but now he's going to go stand before the religious people. And that's going to be a testimony that you don't want to miss. So again, what's the application to all of this? Perhaps you found more than one, but again, let me just reiterate. Make sure you know what your lane is. Where is God blessing primarily? Where do you see his hand in a favorable way? And then get to it, do it with all your heart, especially in these days. And be encouraged and know that you're gifted. I hope you know you're gifted. 
But more than I hope that you know you're gifted, I hope you know what that gift is. Some are gifted with multi different gifts, but at least you have one gift. And if you're a little bit confused or you got some questions about that, a little unsure, I'd love to talk to you about that. So let's pray. Father, again, we just bless your name. We thank you for Paul the Apostle. We thank you, uh, Lord, for how you used him. And Lord, we thank you that you desire now to use us. And we need you, Lord. We need to know your blessing. We need to know your anointing. We need to know your direction. And so I pray blessings on your people. I pray encouragement to their own hearts. And that, Lord, you would raise them up for the very purposes that you have for them individually. In Jesus' name, amen. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.